Hello, I'm Hef Munson. I produce Don Hammond's Arlington Weekly News, AWN Presents, Late Night Filler, and Radio Free Filler, and occasionally a segment for In These Times. The COVID pandemic has brought about many changes in the way Arlingtonians live, but it has also had the effect of highlighting some changes in the way we need to do things in the future even after the pandemic eventually subsides. Two examples are the areas of education and communications. With the implementation of the virtual classroom, the Arlington Public School System has made an effort to continue the education of our younger residents. However, access to these virtual classes has been uneven. Students in homes with poor or non-existent internet access were considerably handicapped, and centralized Wi-Fi hotspots provided only partial relief. With respect to communications, it was necessary to keep Arlingtonians of all ages up to date on the latest dates, times, and locations for both COVID testing and vaccination. Once again, Occupants of homes with inferior access suffered, sometimes not hearing about a pop-up testing event until it was too late. In the future, it seems likely that the need for swift communication will continue, for there are other potentially catastrophic events other than COVID, some of them related to blizzards, heavy rains, tornadoes, and other weather hazards. Traffic accidents, chemical spills, and building fires also require that Arlingtonians be promptly informed. Now and then, there are even good news items or special events that residents want to know about. We are fortunate to have with us an advocate for the improvement of the online communications we need and will continue to need in the future. His name is Tim Dempsey, and I'll turn the microphone over to him now. Um, so my name is Tim Dempsey. I'm an Arlington resident of, uh, I think, uh, see, I moved here in 2011, so 10 years now almost. Uh, I have um, been active in Arlington politics for, for quite a while and uh, mostly kind of centered on uh, these kind of community projects. But um, in short, uh, the group that I'm representing right now uh, is Arlington, Arlington Fiber, RL Fiber, as we tend to call ourselves. Uh, we started as a group, or we started organizing as a group about three years ago, two or three years ago. And our uh, we had been looking to do some economic development projects in South Arlington, uh, based on based on just some statistics and reports we had read coming out of the county and some other uh, some other nonprofit groups. Uh, you know, looking at various social indicators, um, and especially in places like 22204. And uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Dada Kissel, uh, she had been doing a lot of work doing voter registration in the, uh, in the um, affordable housing um, uh, complexes uh, in this area. And uh, she's also very interested in economic development uh, projects there. So and we had been looking initially at uh, doing some things like co-ops uh, and then uh, to not give, you know, go too deep into all the history. But we, we had found out um, based on some inter some interactions with some other people who had working in the broadband space for Arlington and been actually advising the county on using their dark fiber uh, network. So Arlington has uh, an existing what's called dark fiber network. It's, uh, it, it's basically it's a public network that they use for public buildings, the schools community centers, uh, you know, for their internal government operations. 
but they also have a lot of fiber optic um, lines that are dark um, and uh, that are not lit by equipment. Basically, that would you know that would convey a, a signal to, that would provide new data. Data. Uh, so we had found out that they have the you know a, an abundance of this dark fiber, uh, and they were looking to actually lease it, but had not been very successful in it. So. Um, Kind of long story short, our idea had been, well, what if, you know, we know that there's, based on the, some of the reports we've seen from the county, that they had estimated something like 10% um, or more of the county, uh, particularly in this area, um, households did not have access to, to internet at home. Uh, and so we had this idea that we would maybe try to form um, a kind of broadband cooperative that would lease this fiber and, and provide kind of low cost, high quality high-speed service to some of these areas, um, particularly some of these buildings. Uh, so that is how we had kind of started out uh, a few years ago. But then uh, as um, you know, we, you know, we started organizing, we started going to the buildings and going door to door to gather survey information on what people's current uh, internet usage was and you know, who, who they, if, they, if they had internet and what kind of internet they were using and what basically what their needs were. Uh, and that was kind of ongoing. And then uh, the pandemic hit and you know we saw everything kind of shut down uh everything was moving online and we knew that this you know we knew based on our work that this was going to set up a major crisis and that you know became pretty clear to um the news reading public as well uh there's a lot of stories that started coming out about the uh, lack of access in fact washington post in may had a big uh cover story on um just well not cover story but a major story on internet access in arlington and how because arlington even though Arlington had this kind of robust public network, it wasn't actually able to use it uh, easily anyway uh, for the purposes of uh, providing service to these families and these uh, apartment buildings uh, and households that uh, were just basically underserved or unserved uh, due to anything from cost, you know, the, the, the cost of, of signing up for internet or for uh, some, some digital lit literacy issues um, or you know, acquiring the proper equipment to use high-speed internet Etc. So, uh, so we had then at that point kind of pivoted from you know trying to you know, as amateurs and we none of us were experts on any of these things. Um, so we, we kind of pivoted from doing that kind of uh, that kind of work on you know how we, how can we start a co-op to hey you know maybe we need to figure out how the county can just provide internet itself uh, to these people and and you know we were well aware that there are plenty of communities around the United States and even here in Virginia that have a uh, a public, you know, internet service model where the the, the public organized a, um, a local uh, locally owned internet service provider, um, and you know many of them are doing fantastic work on digital divide and you know providing really high speed, low cost service to the residents. So we you know we thought you know if Arlington's already done all this work to build out its own public network, you know how hard should, could it be? to you know, move on from there to doing um, you know, a public network of some sort. So then uh, what we, we pivoted to ultimately was to try to get the county to look into doing uh, what is uh, to, to forming what is basically what's called a, a broadband authority, which is basically a kind of separate public utility uh, that you know, under VA law would allow them to, um, to use their existing network to provide Internet access to uh, whoever they want, frankly, um, but you know, concentrating maybe on the areas that are most underserved right now. Uh, so then we 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 hooked up with some other groups that were doing um, digital equity access work uh, here in the county. There's a particular group called um, Abuelitas, uh, which is a group of retired teachers that had been working with English language learners uh, to try to help them uh, through the pandemic. And you know, these teachers said, you know, these families don't have access at home and that's just a tragedy because you know we have to work with these kids on whatsapp on a phone that you know doesn't have unlimited data plan and just it's just a nightmare so you know they really believed in this kind of work so we teamed up with them and we've kind of made other, other allies that we've gone along but that that was the kind of common core of the group and so uh, what we've been doing is just agitating for the board to, to look into this option of, of creating what's called this broadband authority uh, which, once again, is a, is a public service authority. And, you know, and, and under Virginia law and under many state laws, generally this is the way you form lots of utilities. That's basically what you form what's called an authority. Uh, Virginia created this particular authority back in the, the, the 2000s, early 2000s, 
a number of, of localities have already um, availed themselves of it. Uh, Roanoke Broadband Authority is one. Um, the Eastern Shore of Virginia Broadband Authority is another. Uh, and there's uh, some newer ones forming now. They're all looking to, to basically provide, um, you know, a, a public option for broadband service in, in their respective localities. I mean, mostly because they're not being served by the kind of for-profit uh, corporate, uh, you know, telecoms um, that you generally have, you know, the, their modus operandi has generally been to, to kind of cherry pick. They move into areas where there's high density and, um, you know, or they're higher paying customers and that's, well, they concentrate most of their service. So, like you know, uh, it, it, and you know, they're generally not in any way incentivized to provide service at a, at a cost that you know working class, lower class people can afford. Um, so, this is a problem. That, this is nationally recognized as a problem now, and you see this in the um, you know the, the President Biden's uh, about to roll out or wants to roll out an infrastructure plan where they address these things pretty much head on and said that the, the for-profit telecom networks like Comcast, Verizon, just not have failed to to provide service, provide internet as a utility. Um, and, you know, so we, we definitely need to uh, start providing more funding and opportunities for uh, local governments, for, um, you know, in, in Virginia right now, the electric cooperatives are now heavily getting involved in broadband, providing fiber broadband to their electric customers. Um, you know, so co-ops, municipal governments, uh, nonprofits, whoever, is willing to kind of really just build these networks on a non-discriminatory basis and just try to provide service to everyone uh, once again at a cost that that it, that makes that's affordable to them and 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 so frankly the um, the way this this has been moving now is that we've we've kind of gotten uh, the county boards um, our own county boards uh, attention now um, pointing to some of these other models that are out there just in Virginia alone. Um, Alexandria, for instance, their uh, Information Technology Commission just advised their uh, county, their city council and mayor to form a broadband authority because they're looking to build a public network of their own. Um, they've actually been kind of covetously viewing Arlington's public network for, for quite a while and have been looking to try to build their own. But, um, you know, the difference between Arlington and Alexandria would be that if Alexandria forms a broadband authority um, and to, do, to, to build that public network, they would then be able to uh, provide service to private customers. And Arlington unfortunately formed its broadband, uh, it's, it, it built its internet network um, based on a different part of the law. So they, they cannot legally at this point, without, a broad, without forming a separate broadband authority, they cannot use the existing public network to hook up private subscribers. Um, so that, that's why, that's what the, the necessity of a broadband authority would be. Um, so all that said is that um, through our lobbying and through our kind of consciousness building, um, we have gotten the county board uh, to acquiesce. And in the latest budget, they have now passed, um, uh, they included uh, about $50,000 to do a uh, feasibility study, which will look at uh, the ins and outs of setting up an authority and then using it in particular to uh, to start building a, 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 a public option of, of fiber to the home uh, internet service um, you know to anyone who wants it here in the county uh, so uh, so that generally um, uh, is about as probably as pithily as I can sum up the situation and kind of our history and our efforts uh, as of to date but uh, and if you want to intervene now with uh, with questions, um, I know that it's a lot to take in, so I'll uh, I'll go quiet for a second. Actually, I've got quite a lot of background on this personally. I grew up in 22204, uh, spent my elementary school years there, and early part of uh, what they were calling junior high in those days. And then later as an adult, I bought a part of a house and was living down in 22204. And the discrepancies between the way the northern zip codes were treated and those zip codes is well known right on down to which high schools got the best tools for their shop classes. Uh, also, having had uh, a lot of involvement with the public access station, 
for the past 40 years, Arlington has a funny idea about the word public. My thinking, well, back in 1980, when they were setting up the public access, was the idea uh, that there would be this facility for individual people to broadcast whatever programming or whatever editorializing they wanted to. And public, you have public schools, then you have public parks, and public parks you can just go to generally in Arlington, you don't pay an admission fee. And public schools generally in Arlington, uh, you go and, or your children go, and they don't pay a fee to attend. But for public access, they don't make it so easy. In fact, they require that the cable companies pony up the money to fund a large part of the so-called public access station. And along these lines, I kind of wonder if, especially with the pandemic where so much of so-called public schools had to be online, shouldn't broadband access be as free as the public schools. Would you care to respond to that? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, in, in ideal world, like I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, not even ideal world. I, I think that is a world we need to move towards. Um, the, the, it's become very clear, obviously. I mean, as you, uh, you know, to, to kind of parrot what you just said, it's become clear that this is a, a vital public utility. Um, you know, this is as important as having electricity or water. Um, you know, we we do not. Uh, you know, I, well, I, I'd like to say that you know, few people would think that it's a smart idea to to turn over, for instance, the water utility to a for-profit company. Although places have done that, and then and then quickly <laughs> taking that away. Um, you know, and I, I don't. I think we could probably handle electricity better than having a, a, a large, you know, uh, investor and corporation provide electricity for us, but. Even so, I mean, they have far figured out ways to make sure that everybody is is connected to these vital utilities and are receiving, um, you know, receiving service through it. Um, but I, I agree. I mean, that, you know, and the, and I think that seems to be kind of in the spirit of something of what um, you know, uh, the the current White House is looking at in terms of building infrastructure as to try to provide this provide internet as a utility service. Um, and I agree. I mean, if we could move, I think we could could easily move towards a system over time that would provide internet basically for free, just you know through uh, yeah, as, as taxes. And then and there is a new network actually out in in Oregon, um, uh, Hillsboro, uh, which is one that we actually had looked at as a kind of model, and we had actually arranged a meeting between them and the Department of Technology Services uh, for Arlington uh, to to kind of trade notes. But there. They are building out currently a, a public network, um, and they're going into very low-income areas as their their kind of first priority. And you know, their their attitude is that you know that they're they're going to do it in the most fiscally responsible way. But they said that you know nobody asks if they're going to turn a profit by building a library. You know, and so it's, 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 they're saying it's the same thing with internet. Like the people need it, and it needs to be built out as in terms of infrastructure and service that is public. Um, well, so I'm hoping that I'm hoping that more dovetails with uh, education, but also the dissemination of information as to COVID testing sites right. and uh, other sources of information that are typically disseminated most quickly online. Uh, this is uh, this is an essential part of communications, not just for children but uh, for all people. So yeah, uh, it, uh, it makes a great deal of sense. Uh, you won't get there overnight. And as I say, Arlington has a kind of a funny idea. And of course, the states have, has also, the state has also been constrained in certain respects uh, with respect to, to what can and cannot be done. But I, I did want to put out the idea as an ultimate destination, where and your your analogy of the library is absolutely spot on. Uh, it also because it encompasses uh, all age groups. Yeah, I I I think I mean I think you're absolutely right. I mean it, this is um 
And if, if, you know, we had a public network that was reaching, you know, the majority, especially in these, these areas where the people are probably most likely in need of that information, if you had a centralized provider of some sort or prevent or um, portal anyway, in, in, in through which you would reach the internet, I mean, the, um, that would be made it much easier for the county to push out, you know, information to people directly at their, their home and possibly, you know, directly in the language that they speak or that they read in. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if we had had this already, uh, COVID would have been a lot easier to deal with. Um, you know, they wouldn't have had the, they probably would have saved money. Frankly, they wouldn't have had to go and spend a ton of money printing out physical signs and planting them all over the place or sending people out door to door. I mean, um, you know, so I, I see all these things. I mean, frankly, for the kind of green eye shade conservatives, I mean, this is also something that saves money and it's just make, it's more efficient than, than, uh, currently what we have, uh, this kind of very, um, balkanized, you know, information landscape. Um, so. Yeah. In fact, uh, when we first started the public access television programming, the first two shows were the Arlington weekly news and something called on folk seminal de Arlington, which was translated as the news in Spanish, even though that's not the literal translation. <laughs> And the problem, of course, is a lot of the people who would have appreciated the Spanish uh, language version didn't have the scratch, the access to tune in. Right. <laughs> so this has been uh, going on for, I guess, this is uh, 40 years now. We're coming up uh, for the, the, uh, the original cable thing. So this is an extension of the same concept. Is there a message, as we've hit the 20-minute mark, which is, this is going to be a walloping good interview. Uh, is there a message that you would like to put out to the listeners and or viewers in terms of uh, touch with your organization, especially the ones that maybe don't have broadband? Right. I know this is always the ironic part of doing any kind of these online, um, you know, meetings or interviews and, and what else. I'm just like, you know, it's, it's ironic because like we started our organization out as a, you know, as, because we were very concerned about digital divide and improving, uh, you know, making sure that internet access is kind of universal. Uh, and yet, you know, <laughs> so there's always a, the hint of irony in that, that, you know, we're, uh, we will not, inevitably not reach the people necessarily that we want to. I mean, although we are looking to do some more kind of like uh, door to door uh, work moving into the, um, the uh, kind of post vaccine uh, warmer weather months. But uh, I, I would say at this point, the, my main message is that, uh, you know, please, if you're interested, visit us at rlfiber.org, uh, and uh, you know you, you can sign up there. You can send us a message to sign up and get involved in our activities. Uh, and uh, also, you know, if if you're inclined to, please contact the county board members uh, through either through email or you know on social media, tag them in the you know, posts or whatever. Uh, you know, kind of calling on them to to really. Um, uh, roll up their sleeves and get this done uh, and really put in the work that needs to be done to make it happen. Uh, because it's not, it, it's a, it's a kind of long-term project and it's not, you know, not for the faint of heart. Um, you know, we're, we're the, the county will have to expend some resources, but uh, we, we really believe, and especially we even have some evidence that other places that have done it have had, you know, tremendous, tremendous returns in uh, all kinds of ways, not just economic, but also social and, 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 um, and cultural and everything else. So, uh, so if you are interested in this, you know, please sign up. But the biggest thing you can do is just to kind of contact the county board and let them know that you're interested in this uh, and you, you think this is a good idea because that's that's what they're going to want to hear. You know, there's going to be a lot of pushback from uh, the, the lo local incumbents uh, as we move forward on this. So uh, the local incumbent ISP, such as Comcast, Verizon, that is. So uh, so yeah, that that would be my message to to everyone else. That, and um you know, and, and thank you in advance for your support. There's a very good uh, line on your website that says, learn more about our vision and our campaign by reading our Arlington Broadband Authority FAQ. And that can be found on the, uh, the website. And so that would be uh, a good place also uh, for people to crank up their questions for the board. All right. Uh, anything else on your end? 
No, thank you so much for, for hearing me out and, and helping us uh, get out uh, the message, definitely. So um, I, I hope in a, in a future uh, public broadband option that that will you know, do wonders for our Arlington Independent Media, because I think that um, getting you guys off of the dependence on Comcast and the cable franchises, I think, would be a um, you know, major boon. <laughs> To, to having ind actual independent media. Um, that's, well, the other you know, thing with Arlington Independent Media is they are moving over toward the uh, internet end of things. Uh, you can stream the shows online already, both the TV and radio shows. So yeah, I think there's going to be a convergence of, uh, of the media, although it's going to converge in an online uh, environment. It's it's inevitable. And this is, and this is good. So we'll all actually be... Uh, in the same great big barn. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Tim Dempsey. I will thank you, Tim Dempsey, like what's a real person here, rather than me spouting to an audience. Thank you, Tim Dempsey, for taking the time to get the word out. That's Hef Munson signing off. Well, after that lame attempt at a sign-off, I'd better finish with a reminder about the Arlington Independent Media Fund Drive. Technically, the event runs from April 26th through May 16th, with one highlight known as Couchella on May 7th and 8th. You can get the details on either WERA.FM or ArlingtonMedia.org. However, in case they run this program after the fundraiser ends on May 16th, you can still donate via either of the two websites, 